Welcome to the Revolution Will Be live stream. Let's talk about the color of revolution. How you doing, brother Kamau? I'm doing good. Doing good. Feeling good. Yeah, man. I'm excited about this episode, man. Um, I was listening to a podcast this morning with Dallas Austin. And Dallas Austin is one of the most successful R&B hip hop producers uh, who really put the Atlanta scene on the map big time in the 90s, working with everybody from TLC, ABC, Boys to Men, you name it, it ran through Dallas Austin. And one of the things he said in that interview, interview really jumped out at me and is, is very relevant to what we're gonna do today. He was talking about how at that time, the hip hop and R&B scene was, was characterized in terms of East Coast versus West Coast. And when he looked at the landscape, he said, they never gonna accept us in New York. They never gonna accept us in California. We gotta make our own stuff. And he focused on the South, the Southern culture, the Southern sound, and began to do the work to put Atlanta on the map. When I heard those words, we gotta make our own stuff, I thought to myself, that right there is the spirit of Black America. On the surface, that may sound like a pessimistic refrain of people who fold their arms and say good things can't happen because nobody's going to help us out. But it is actually the basis for the very spirit of self-determinism that is responsible for all the progress that we have seen from day one with Black folks in this country. When Michael Jackson penned those words, all I want to say is that they don't really care about us. He wasn't saying good things can't happen for us because they don't care about us, but rather because they don't care about us, we got to care for ourselves and good things won't happen for us unless we make them happen. And, you know, I, I consider myself to be a freedom loving voluntarist who is willing to work with anybody that is concerned about promoting the freedom and economic self-sufficiency of all people. And sometimes when black people get talked about within the context of that conversation, black people get talked about as if we are always looking for some politician to save us, as if we are always looking for someone else to be the one to deliver us. But when I study black American history, I see the spirit of a people who had a healthy sense of skepticism towards the willingness of government to swoop down and deliver on its promises. And people who said, hey y'all, we gotta work together and invest in our own communities and do our own thing. So for me, self-help and spirituality has always been the hero. It's, it's the faith that we have in our creator and not only in what our creator can do for us, but in what our creator can do through us. And so what we're gonna do today in, in honor of Black History Month is we're gonna talk about that thread of self-determinism that has run through Black communities throughout history. And we're gonna do what we always do by talking about that Rev One philosophy of, of self-reliance, but we're gonna do it through the lens of great black activists, artists, and thinkers throughout history. And so I put together a sort of top 10 um, of, of, of self-help quotes by great black figures. And you and I are gonna go back and forth and riff on it, man. How you feel about that? Uh, I'm looking for my flame over here because that intro was just hot. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling it. You got me pumped up. <laughs> well, hey, man, let's go ahead and dive in, brother. Let's let's go to this first yep. one. Brother James Baldwin, the great James Baldwin. Before we read the quote, uh, we'll show the quote here. Let's talk a little bit about Baldwin. James Baldwin was an American novelist, playwright, essayist, poet, and activist. His essays collected in Notes of a Native Son explore intricacies of racial, sexual, and class distinctions in the Western society of the United States during the mid 20th century. Um, my personal recommendation from James Baldwin is to check out I Am Not Your Negro, a uh, very powerful brother. And the quote from James Baldwin is, freedom is not something that anybody can be given. Freedom is something people take and people are as free as they want to be. Let's riff on that one for a little bit. You know, for me, man, probably one of the most important pieces of advice my father gave me came when I was a teenager and I was pouring my heart out to him, man. I was complaining about my job, complaining about my friends, complaining about all sorts of things in my life. And I thought for sure that when my dad listened to me, he was gonna maybe cry or be like, man, son, 
I'm sorry that you're going through that. And that man looked me right in the eye and he said, son, welcome to reality. Hmm. And I remember being so mad because it felt like such an unempathetic response. It was one of those, dad, I want my mom moments. But over the years, that advice has served me more profitably than almost anything that anyone else has told me. And one of the things he taught me is that if there's a conversation that needs to happen in your life, whether it's a conversation about health, a conversation about success, a conversation of money, else, you've got to be the one to take the lead on making that conversation happen. All too often, we victimize ourselves by kind of waiting on somebody else to take the lead in the conversation. I shouldn't have to tell them what I want. I shouldn't have to ask for X, Y, Z. I shouldn't have to, you know, fight for what I want. And it's like, yeah, you know, maybe you shouldn't have to, but the question is not, should you have to? The question is, are you willing to do whatever it takes to make your personal definition of freedom happen for you? And what I love about this Baldwin quote is that it captures the idea that freedom is the type of thing that by its very nature always has to be fought for. No one's going to make freedom easier. No one's going to say, hey, I think you're 19 now and you deserve a little bit of freedom. You got to step up and say, this is something that I demand and you've got to prioritize it and go get it for yourself. Yeah, the question that comes to mind for me is who's supposed to fight for you if you're not willing to fight for yourself? Mm. It, it, it comes back to the ability to act without somebody giving you permission to act, the ability to act without somebody telling you to act, and, and the ability to act based off of your own convictions and priorities and preferences. Um, it is your ability to do what you feel is best, um, regardless of other people's opinions, regardless of other people's, um, you know, their priorities and their preferences. Nobody's going to take care of you Nobody's going to look out for you the way that you should look out for yourself. If you don't have your best interests in mind, then I think it's unrealistic to expect others to have that. You know, it's, I think it kind of comes back to self-worth. You know, you hear a lot of times in the dating world that, you know, you, you attract what you are. This is the kind of person that you're showing up as. These are the kind of people you're going to attract. And I think the same is true, you know, when you're fighting for the things that matter to you, you nobody's just gonna show up if you're not keeping that same energy for yourself if you're not putting out that this is what i want how can you expect to attract that back and so i think you know james baldwin Bal baldwin excuse me uh was one of the bravest and most boldest freedom fighters that have came um that have, have came and impacted our community and and i think he, there was a lot of controversy um you know and, and he faced a lot of you know, backlash, criticism, um, I mean, the whole gamut. And I think there becomes a point where you, you go through that much fire, you go through that much resistance, and you don't have a choice but to stop caring. You don't have a choice but to stop asking for, for permission. Uh, the only way forward is through the flames. And I think a lot of these freedom fighters that we're going to cover today uh, experienced that, and they thrived because of that. They thrived because people weren't giving them pats on the backs or, um, you know, weren't hugging them and loving on them. Maybe towards the end of their career, once they had a lot of momentum and a lot of success, but a lot of these revolutionaries, their ideas go against the grain. They're not comfortable to deal with. Uh, and it takes the bold and the brave to say those kinds of things. And so you have to have the personal conviction that I'm coming out and I'm going to speak my mind and I'm going to speak my inner truth to set myself free, not to help anybody else, not to, uh, you know, move any anybody else's agenda forward, but but to set my own personal freedom um, and, and, and just give more life to what I'm trying to do. I love it, man. A question I'll leave with the audience on this quote is how can I give myself the permission to take the lead on the conversations that need to happen in my life about personal freedom. Let's go to number two. Madam CJ Walker, the entrepreneur extraordinaire. Madam CJ Walker was an American entrepreneur, philanthropist, and political and social activist. 
She is recorded as the first female self-made millionaire in America in the Guinness Book of World War Records. All right, here's the, here's the quote I got too for her. There is no royal flower strewn path to success. And if there is, I have not found it. For whatever success I have attained has been the result of much hard work and many sleepless nights. Don't sit down and wait for the opportunities to come. Get up and make them. Wow, this one's all you, Kamal. I think what's what's most appealing about this quote is that permissionless mindset that I uh, I, I can't afford to allow anybody else to. Uh, make my opportunities for me, that I am a abled body adult with an abled body mind. And it would be it would be a waste to come to this earth with the opportunity of life, the opportunity to, of my intelligence, and to not make something of it to not impact the world to not uh, break records to not uh, open doors. And I think to the extent that you're living in that personal freedom and that personal truth, you're creating your own opportunities for yourself. And I think that's what you should be focused on. But the, the end result of that or, or the other side of that is that you've literally opened so many doors for people behind you, for, for generations behind you, for, for people who were also interested in the things that you're interested in. It's a topic that I feel like we harp on a lot here is, is when you're passionate about something, there are other people in the world who are passionate about that exact same thing. Um, they might mm. not have the courage to pursue that. And and them watching you do that, um, mm. I think it, it just it has such a powerful ripple effect and, and can mobilize so many people's dreams, so many people's ideas. That's how you change the world. That's how you create a better world is, is, you know, you focus on your convictions, you focus on uh, your ability to change the world um, through your creative actions and, and, and your intentionality. And that ripple effect just, you know, for generations. Um, Am I still there? Looks like I broke up on my end. Yeah, I think we okay, both looks like I'm still here. Yeah, yeah. It, she she was the only woman doing these kind of things, and and she's been long gone. But I know so many young women today who who aspire to be like her, who who use the things that she did as strength to fill their own ideas and their own visions and their own projects. So, you know, it, it's so important to 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 find and unlock that inner freedom. Uh, and the ripple effects of that are, they're unmatched. It's hard to explain. You explained it well, man. I, I think what I'll, what I'll contribute to it is, I think that second quote of hers in particular about the importance of making it happen for yourself captures for me the distinction between luck and a plan. You know, luck is something, some, some unexpected good event that happens. And when, when it does happen, you're grateful for it. But a plan is something that's within your locus of control. It's something that you know is within your power to make happen even if you don't get lucky. And it's okay to hope that you get lucky while you're working your plan, but you should never plan on getting lucky. You know, if I'm walking around and I find a $20, $20 bill on the ground and there's no one around to claim it, Hey, I might consider that my lucky day and put that money in my pocket, but I'm not going to spend the next hour walking around hoping to find another one. And I think sometimes it can be easy for people to hear this kind of message as, as a message that, that undersells the existence of good people that are willing to help you out. And I say, you know, there are always good people out there. There are always people out there that are willing to, to, to help you out that are willing to, to share their knowledge and information. And when that happens, you should be grateful for it. But when you're constructing your plan for how you wanna create the results that matter most to you in life, you should construct that plan to be luck resilient. You should construct a plan that is capable of working, 
even if you aren't discovered, even if you don't have a rich uncle, even if you don't meet a bunch of nice people that say, hey, I feel some sympathy for your journey. Let me go ahead and help you out. And then when the luck comes, hey, that's awesome. That's fantastic. It's, it's like gravy on the mashed potatoes. But if it never comes, you still got something to do anyway. And you don't find yourself being deflated when you're not getting the lucky breaks that the people around you are getting. All right, let's go to number. Oh, so, so I'm going to leave a question again. So my question for this one is, how can you take responsibility for creating your own luck in life? All right, let's go to number three, brother W.E.B. Du Bois. Let's check out this quote. Just for a little context, W.E.B. Du Bois was an American sociologist, historian, civil rights activist, pan-Africanist, author, writer, and editor, and he was one of the founders for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, better known as the NAACP. The most important thing to remember is this, to be ready at any moment to give up what you are for what you might become. To me, this is one of the most powerful quotes I've ever heard in my entire life. You know, um, are you willing to die to the roles that you have become addicted to playing in order to actualize the possibilities of who you might be? We often look at our potential in these romantic terms. Oh, wow, like that's that's something I can become one day and I'll be richer and I'll be healthier and I'll be happier. But in order to actualize that potential, in order to, to achieve that vision that you have of yourself, you've got to pay a price. You've got to be willing to let go of certain comfort zones. You've got to be willing to redefine the relationships that you have in your life. You might have to establish new boundaries that you've never established before. And it's it's a kind of dying, if you will. I, I, I know mm -hmm. for me, I, I don't know, I don't know what this example would be for you, but I know for me, healthy eating is like that. Man, I love junk food. I love the way it tastes, you know, like. I just love it so much. And my wife and I are, are making a concerted effort to eat clean and take care of our bodies because I'm at a stage in my life where I can't just get away with it anymore. Like I feel, you know, that brain funk when I don't eat healthy. I feel that low energy when I don't eat healthy. But man, it's like a simple change like that requires me to die to my past self because if I, if I want to sit down and watch TV, I'm used to snacking on something and I can't do that. You know, and I've, I've even experienced moments of what has felt like food depression, where it's like, man, I got to eat this, you know, this healthy meal. And yeah, I know you can make it fine. I get all of that. But when you're so accustomed to living your life in a certain way and using something like food for entertainment, making the decision to be healthy, it's exciting on one end because you get to achieve this vision of yourself. But it's like a part of you is dying because it's like, man, this is this is who I've been for the past 10 years. I've allowed myself to be comfortable in this way, but I've got to let it go because I'm so in love with who I want to become. And I guess my question for the audience would be, do you love who you want to become enough to let go of the luxury of being who you are right now? Which, what about you, man? I, I think this is such an important just piece of advice. And I, and I think, I, I just love I love the quote, you know, be be prepared yeah. uh, at any time to give up what you are for what you want to become. And so much of that, those first couple steps is just the mental preparation is, is just having the funeral in your head um, and getting over that loss, mourning, mourning, whatever that past life was in your head and making the conscious decision to move forward. I think to the extent that mm. you try to move forward haphazardly and you don't really fully commit, you're not going to make the change. I think making changes, it's it, it's a systemized approach to it. You can't just go into it and think or expect to rely on your real power. You can't just go into it and expect to, it to rely on your motivation or your inspiration. Change takes time. It takes uh, intentionality, but more than anything, it takes strategy. It takes having the things in, in place to reinforce that change, whether that is an accountability partner, whether that is 
just a, 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 a fixed plan that you can follow to the end destination of that change. You know, I, I know for you and, and just a lot of people who, who are eating healthy, right? There, there's certain diets like keto and Whole30, things that you can follow that you aren't just relying on your willpower or this inner motivation to say, I'm going to eat this today or I'm going to eat that. I think change takes a lot of creativity. It takes keeping things fresh. It takes being uncomfortable mm. or being comfortable with being uncomfortable. And so change is is first happens in the mind, then it happens, you know, in your life and, and you experience it. So I think to the extent that people are prepared for the change, that people are not only committed, um, but they're very just intentional about how they go about the change. You know, they, they can overcome who they were to become what they want to be. I love that point you made about how it's, um, I, I don't know exactly how you put it, but it's, it's not just about giving up what you don't want to do anymore, but it's also about finding ways to, to be creative with the thing you want to do, keeping it fresh. I, I really love that point. All right, man, I may have found a long lost, lost relative with this next one, bro. This might be a family member, man. I might have some important history in the, in the Coleman line. This next, this next quote comes from Bessie Coleman. And look, man, she kind of looks like a younger version of my mom. I don't know, come out. <laughs> <laughs> no, low key, she does. <laughs> Let's take That's a look funny. at this quote from Bessie Coleman. Bessie Coleman, for context, was an early American civil aviator. She was the first African American woman and first Native American to hold a pilot license. Uh, she was the first Black person to earn an international pilot's license. I decided Blacks should not have to experience the difficulties I had faced. So I decided to open a flying school and teach other Black women to fly. This is very similar to uh, a quote that I, I often reference and it's criticized by creating. I, I think that is, mm. that is the spirit of all progress right there. You can, you can take two approaches. You can compete over the existing system or you can create an alternative system. You can wait for the status quo to, to evolve and change, or you can produce elements of disruption. And a big part of what we talk about here all the time is having that disruption mentality. And one of the guests we interviewed last year talked about that concept of disrupting yourself, right? Uh, so if there's, if there's something that you see in your world that you don't like, the first thing to do is not resent that anger, but to explore what is right about that anger. Maybe you're angry at that thing. Maybe you're dissatisfied with that thing because there is something within you that is born, designed, and optimized to change that thing. So listen to your anger and dissatisfaction. Don't suppress it. Don't push it away as if it's something unenlightened for you to feel. And then when you've, when you've tuned in to what it is you're angry about, ask yourself, well, instead of waiting for someone to do something about it, what if I assume that I am the somebody that's capable of doing something about it? What if I took my creative power seriously? And as Gandhi said, I held myself to the standard of being the change that I want to see in the world. I think sometimes, we are afraid of speaking up, speaking out. I remember we had Minda Hartz on the show last year, and she said one of the things that gave her the courage to use her voice and to write her book is because she knew that even if she would have been all right, someone would have come along after her and experienced the same thing. And so that sense of responsibility is what propelled her forward. What if there are people out there that are gonna follow their dreams precisely because they were inspired by you following your dreams? What if there are people out there that are going to use their voice because they heard you use your voice and said, I wonder if that's possible for me. Your dedication to your own hero's journey might very well be the key to unlock someone else's sense of possibility. Never underestimate how great you are capable of doing for others simply by stepping up and using your own voice and doing what's within you. Mm, love that. Definitely, definitely, definitely. You know, I, I actually interpreted a bit differently. I, I think that this quote for me uh, really 
speaks to how people how pe- how people can help the communities that they're called to help by being brave enough to go outside of the status quo, being brave enough um, mm-hmm. to do the things that you know people in that community might not think is typical for somebody in that community. So at that time, obviously flying wasn't something that, you know, you know, women did and and especially black women. So I I think it, it, there takes some bravery uh, to be able to be uncomfortable with the judgment that might get cast on you to be uncomfortable with the criticism, like, no girl, you need to go be a teacher or you need to go, um, you know, be a nurse or, or, or something that fits in the status quo of, you know, maybe who you are, where you come from. There has to be a certain braveness and boldness as you approach unlocking your inner freedom. It, it, it has, you have to be brave enough to trailblaze at the face of uncertainty, at the face of, um, you know, criticism. And I think, you know, people who do that, empower their community so much more they might not feel it or see it on the front end but once you've stepped out and you've stepped into this field again you 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 make room for other people to do the same thing but i think we're always going to be limited as a community to the things uh that we're too scared to go out and try you know if if we're too scared uh to be a data scientist or if we're too scared to, you know, be a, I don't know, cannabis farmer, whatever that, whatever that extent is going to be, whatever those limitations uh, that you might have around who you are, where you come from and what you're supposed to do, that's limiting. It's limiting the ability, it's limiting the potential of other people in your community. So if you really want to serve your community, go out, be bold, do the things that aren't Mm -hmm traditionally done within or by the people from those communities. So you, you, you made the point of the day for me, man. I think that's right on the money. Um, I think it is so important for us to never stop extending society's understanding of what it means to, to be black, right? That, that, that being black should never be a hindrance in the sense of, you feeling like there's something that you cannot learn or there's there's a, a, an area of interest that you cannot explore because black people have not yet ventured out in that direction or because there has been a narrative that we're not good at that or that we don't succeed at that. No matter what it is, if we are not represented in that field, if that field does not play a, as big of a role in our culture as other things like how hockey might be compared to basketball, how NASCAR might be compared to rapping. There is always room for us to be the first person in our community, the second, third, fourth person in our communities to go do interesting things, to go do remarkable work, and then to turn around and say, hey, look, I've paved the way. If you wanna do this, you can do it too. And we have made that part of the definition of being black. We are not loyal to some arbitrary, restricted, uncreative definition that says, oh, I can't be a hockey player. I can't be an aviator, something like that. But we're always evolving it. We're always extending it. Um, I think you made that point really well, man. All right, we're gonna go to the next one. This is Claudette Colvin. This is a very interesting story um, about Claudette Colvin. So she did the Rosa Parks thing before the Rosa Parks thing. And she has a very compelling story. You know, when we think about the um, uh, the protests that, that led to more equality, that was based on Rosa Parks' uh, infamous decision, that was the more famous story. But years before that, we had the story of Claudette Colvin. So just a little bit of context. She's a retired American nurse aide. She was a pioneer of the 1950s civil rights movement. And the important date here was March 2nd, 1955. She was 15 years old and she was arrested in Montgomery, Alabama for refusing to give up her seat to a white woman on a crowded, segregated bus. All right, here's the quote. 
and I, and I, and I have two here. I knew then, and I know now that when it comes to justice, there is no easy way to get it. You can't sugarcoat it. You have to take a stand and say, this is not right. I felt like Sojourner Truth was pushing down on one shoulder and Harriet Tubman was pushing down on the other saying, sit down, girl. I was glued to my seat. Mm. <laughs> Man, I love you that, imagine, last bro? That, that last quote. That last quote is really funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, I think that's awesome. I think to, I think this is, this really just harps on the point that you have to listen to your heart. You have to listen to your mm -hmm. gut. You have to listen to what your soul is telling you to do because a lot of times it's, we can't explain it. We don't know why we're called to do what we're called to do. We don't know why we're, we're, that this is the hill that we're choosing to die on, that this is the, the conviction that we are not going to fold on, that we are deciding to act upon. And if you can't explain it, but you feel it, that's fine. You still got to go with the feeling. You got to go with what you know to be true, even if nobody else sees it, even if nobody else is like, girl, we could just go home. You know, we don't want to cause trouble. Uh, you know, let's just go home. We'll, we'll live to fight another day. But if you feel called, you're like, no, I ain't going nowhere. I'm about to make a stand right here, right now, because that's what I believe in. And I think that is so powerful. It's not getting too caught up in your head. It's not getting too caught up in uh, what would be the right thing to do? What would be this? What would be that? Sometimes you just got to go with what you feel. Sometimes you got to go with your gut. Um, and and I, I think this is just such a, a testament to that. It, and a lot of times I think what, what she said in the first quote that I thought was really interesting is I knew then and then I know now. God, does it feel good when you make that kind of call in the moment yeah. and you, you just go with the feeling, but you don't know exactly, but you think, you know, and so you go with it and then you come out to be correct. Right. You come out um, and, and, and you're just, you experience what it was like um, to go with the inner truth and to win, to bet on yourself and, and, and to be victorious. And I think uh, that feeling will never be achieved if you're overanalyzing, if you're too scared to do it. You just got to go with it. And I think that's what she did. And while that inner truth was, while she felt it at the time, I'm sure there was some level of uncertainty. I'm sure there was, she was uncomfortable and she wanted to get up, but she decided to stay. And, and that one effect or that one decision had such a ripple effect where hindsight, looking back, she knew, yeah, I'm glad I did that. That was the right decision. Yeah. 15 years old. <laughs> 15, man. It's something, um, it's something about being yeah. young where you're just like, you're, I think you, you don't think as much. You don't overanalyze things as much. You kind of just do. Yeah. I, I, I like that. It, it's, it's also an illustration of how when you don't have a choice, you choose, you know, um, mm -hmm. so, sometimes we, we look at things like difficult, because we have we have the option we have the option to not take a stand you know we have the option to look the other way i i think i think what i love about this quote was the part i mean i visualized that man sojourner truth on one on one side harriet tubman on the other she's got those ancestral angels saying sit down girl we right here with you we got your back you are not alone that to me testifies to the power of having a sense of history you know, backward looking gratitude produces forward looking faith. When you can look back on the past and you see the people that have fought the battles before you, that have gone through the things that you are going through, just a different version at a different time on a different day, it gives you strength because you have that sense of, well, wait a minute, I'm I'm not by myself. I'm, I'm part of something that's bigger than me. Even if I can't see the fullness of what it is I'm a part of, I am part of something that is bigger than me. I am part of the building of an invisible kingdom, you know? And, and when the story is told, when it's all said and done, I'm, I'm gonna be one of many people who went through this kind of suffering and persecution in order to make the right thing happen. Malcolm X said that of all of our studies, history will most reward our research. This right here, is a lesson from black history that perfectly illustrates the power of studying black history. 
This is why the objection of like, hey, man, wh why we got to keep looking at the past and like studying something that's already over? This is why that objection fails, because it is not just about reliving past pain for the sake of enjoying a pain fetish. We are reliving events of the past for the sake of drawing a wisdom that allows us to move forward. Because just because you're ignorant of history, it doesn't mean that you're unaffected by history. We're always affected by history. So when we make ourselves informed about the people that have gone before us and the things they've achieved, it gives us motivation during the hard times in life. And that helps move us forward. I heard somebody say about tradition. They said, tradition is not the dead faith of the living. Tradition is the living faith of the dead. The way that we keep our faith alive is by studying the people that have come before us and have paved the way for us to move forward. So, man, I just think that was so powerful and I, I love that visual, man. All right, we're gonna go to this next one. And this is Hazel Dorothy Scott. Um, infamous jazz musician. Let's go ahead and check out the wow. quote. Say it again. I was going to say she's gorgeous. She's gorgeous. Absolutely, man. Well, she was a, a Trinidadian born jazz and classical pianist. She was also a singer and an actor. So she was a triple threat. Uh, she was critically, she was a critically acclaimed performing artist and an outspoken critic of racial discrimination and segregation. And she used her influence to improve the representation of Black Americans in film. Here's the quote from Hazel Scott. Whoever walked behind anyone to freedom, if we can't go hand in hand, I don't want to go. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> yeah. I, I love this one, man, because she's basically saying freedom over everything, freedom over everything. And I, I heard somebody say one time, I would rather be epic all by myself than be alone with anybody else. And what I hear from, from Hazel Dorothy Scott is, I would rather be free and in disunity with you than to be in unity with you at the expense of my freedom. And I think that is so important because while I strongly advocate for the importance of looking for a common ground and being at peace with one another, all too often, the basis of manipulation is when you allow yourself to be seduced by a message of peace at the expense of your principles, your priorities, and your preferences. Don't ever neutralize who you are just to be at peace with someone else. If staying true to your convictions means that you can't get along with somebody because they're gonna fold their arms and say, well, I refuse to be your friend or your ally unless you change your beliefs, you better stick with your convictions. Right. Because you're not going to find freedom by walking behind somebody else. You're going to find freedom by walking alongside them and say, we will work together, but we will work together mm. as equals, respecting the image of God that is upon us both. Point blank, period. Period. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I actually interpreted this as a, a leadership quote. I, I think there is a lot of value to various different leadership styles. I think there's a lot of leaders who think that is it is necessary that I'm the front of the pack, that I have to be the line leader, that I have to call the shots and tell everybody what to do. And then there's other leaders who uh, approach things from more of a, a servant uh, leadership role, that I am here to, uh, to, to serve the people who I am trying to foster to this destination or, or um, you know, move them forward to to wherever they're trying to go. And I think what I like about this is is that, it, you know, if if you if she can't go hand in hand, then she doesn't want to go. That that she wants to not necessarily be the front of the pack. That I'm I'm trying to lead the way. I I don't necessarily want to be the the back of the pack. I want to be in the middle. I want to 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 help the people who are fighting for the things that are important to me. Who are fighting for the freedoms that are necessary. Um, I want to be right next to them. I want to be right in the middle of that. I don't need to be anywhere else yeah. but in the middle of that. And and I just love that approach. I love it, man. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I enjoy the different ways that we approach these quotes and the different ways they land, because that's something that I didn't even think about as a philosophy of leadership. So that's a dope mm -hmm. insight. All right, let's go to brother Marcus Garvey. 
Marcus Garvey was tough for me because he has a lot of quotes I wanted to use. A lot. We, we could have just did a top 10 from Marcus Garvey. But let, let's take a look at, at what I picked. A little bit of context. Marcus Garvey was a political activist, publisher, journalist, entrepreneur, and orator. So many of the people that we have read fall into that category. It's just so multifaceted. He was the founder and first president general of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, through which he declared himself provisional president of Africa. All right. The quote is, we are going to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery. For though others may free the body, none but ourselves can free the mind. Yes. Mind yes. our only rule, sovereign. Mm. <laughs> you know what this reminds me of? It, it, it actually reminds me when you hear people talk about being in jail or being in prison and so much of that battle is the mental, right? I, obviously, prison is a terrible place. Uh, it's a place that, um, in, in in my mind, it, it looks torturous. It looks like the worst possible place to be. Um, and s people go crazy. People people don't know what to do with themselves. People, you know, commit suicide. All these horrible acts happen um, in prison. But I think the people who are able to make it out the people who are mentally strong the people who um you know come out on the other side stronger than they went in are the people who didn't allow those four walls um to restrict their freedoms the people who found ways to unlock uh the mental freedom the spiritual freedom um the emotional freedom and and make best use of that time. And I, you know, you hear a lot of people giving advice, um, or just a lot of, we'll call them OGs who've been through that giving advice to other people who might be going through that or, or, or just providing context on what that's like. And, and they always talk about that it starts with freeing your mind first that that they can lock down your body, but that they cannot lock down your mind. And I think that this, um, this adage expands beyond just that one example that regardless of whatever situation you're in, regardless of however it feels like you're being um, that, that you're being oppressed, that if you are able to first mentally free yourself, so much can change for you. So much is possible once you're able to break the mental constraints of of slavery, of oppression. And I think, you know, on the other side of that, a lot of people talk about um the current landscape of of uh, we'll call it racial injustice and, and just oppression today. A lot of times it might not look like uh, people being out on a field picking cotton. Um, I think there but there is such thing as mental slavery. If, if you can uh, kill a person's hope, if you can kill a person's faith, if you can completely uh, deteriorate all the things that they value and that matter to them, I, I, I think you've locked them up, you, you've enslaved them. And I think that's, that's, it's such a, a mm. sad, but also very relevant concept that that there are people today who aren't free, that they're mentally enslaved, because they don't have um, hope, they don't have faith, they don't have the things that make them want to find inner freedom that make them want to live out their inner truth. And it's just so, 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 so important. And I'm glad we're talking about this because this is so much of what we're trying to combat with Revolution One. It, it is about first revolutionizing your mind, first revolutionizing yourself, your intentions um, to, to then create a bigger change. But you, it has to start with you. It has to start with your mindset. And then through that, everything else is possible. Very well said, man. And sometimes emphasis on the mental side of the equation gets dismissed as a bunch of fluffy fantasy based thinking almost as if we think the inner life the inner game of freedom is some sort of consolation prize for the real thing but to to adopt that viewpoint completely misunderstands the nature of freedom freedom by its very nature must contain within itself the possibility for choosing its own demise if i am free then that means i must have the power to make choices 
that can lead to my own enslavement. And we see this happening today. It may not be physical enslavement, but think about debt enslavement. And, and, and that is the result of unhealthy choices that are being made that stem from a certain kind of mindset, you know? So it really does begin with thinking. And even if we had the perfect politicians, the perfect system of governance, even if we waved a magic wand and made society as free as it could possibly be, there is no way to account for the fact that people, if they don't have a freedom mindset, could easily give that up in exchange for the exact kind of world that we have right now. So it's not just about having freedom, it's also about being able to hold on to freedom. It's about being able to handle the freedom that you have and you will never hold on to it. You will never handle it competently and creatively if you don't have that freedom mindset. And so it truly does begin with the thinking. It's not about running from physical reality, it's about recognizing that my physical reality, my circumstantial reality is oftentimes negotiable. And it's the consequence of how I rearrange the mental furniture of my beliefs. And so the most powerful thing about it is it's it's within the locus of your control. And, and this is why we talk so much about the inner freedom equation, because, all right, you got a break from election day. So what now? You can you know, either just sit back and be happy all the time, or you can sit back and be mad all the time, but you got to live your life. You got to do something. Okay. So even if you are all about politics, what are you going to do between now and the next election day? You build yourself. And that starts with building the mindset. So when you look out at the world and you see things that make you mad and make you want to say, look here, guys, I don't want to talk about inner freedom when they're raising taxes. I don't want to talk about this inner freedom fluff when, you know, they're, they're, they're taking away our, 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 mobility and things along those lines. Okay. But at the end of the day, if you're right about the bad stuff you see in the world, you would agree that something must be done, right? And the idea that something must be done is very different from the idea that we should just sit around and complain about. What's the difference? It's the mindset that generates the idea. Something must be done. And that idea must come from a certain mindset. And if you're going to do anything about it, you've got to adopt the mindset of an innovator who is willing to create around the systems of oppression that weigh down upon us. And so it truly does start with the mind. Speaking of the mind, we're gonna move to the next one. One of my favorites, one of my favorites, Frederick Douglass. All right, um, wow. Um, th this is how I wanna look, by the way, when I get older. So I, I, hope, I hope this is how I look. <laughs> Let's check. <laughs> <laughs> Frederick Douglass was an American social reformer, abolitionist, writer, and statesman. After escaping from slavery in Maryland, he became a national leader of the abolitionist movement in Massachusetts and New York, becoming famous for his incisive anti-slavery writings. The quote here from Frederick Douglass is, knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. Well, let me give some context for this quote. In one of his autobiographies, he talks about the time when he learned how to read. When he was a little boy, he was in the house with many of the other children. He wasn't uh, old enough, big enough, strong enough to work out in the fields yet. And his slave master's wife was you know, somewhat new and naive when it came to this slavery game. And she made the mistake of teaching Frederick Douglass some of the basics of how to read along with the other children. He was around when the reading lessons were happening. And one day her husband, the slave master comes in and sees this and he snaps. He is irate and he chastises his wife for allowing him to be in the midst of these reading lessons. And he tells her, that knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. And when Frederick Douglass heard those words, and when he saw just the anger that his slave master had about him learning to read, he thought to himself, now I know the ticket to freedom. You know, that man's not gonna be so angry about that if, if this isn't something that's really, really powerful. And I tell you, reading, 
still has the ability to change your life. Now, because of technology, the game has changed. You don't technically have to scan words on the text. You can listen to audiobooks, you can listen to podcasts, you can watch YouTube videos. It's actually become easier than ever to consume content. But the idea here is that the more you learn about how the universe works, the more you learn about how your mind works, the more you learn about the tools that are at your disposal, the more you increase your vocabulary of mental models and stories and biographies and inspiration and all these different types of things, the more incompatible your beingness becomes with just living a life of compliance and conformity, of just being someone who just does what you are told without the consideration of your own priorities and your own purpose in life. And Frederick Douglass, he actually lived this. He began to get more and more creative. In fact, once these reading lessons were taken away, he was so addicted to, to, to learning how to read and, 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 and to the promise of freedom that would come from it, that sometimes he would take his little measly portion of food. I mean, slaves were given just a measly portion of food. He would take that measly portion of food and he would sneak out into the city and he would find poorer white children and he would trade with them. He said, I would give you my food in exchange for reading wow. lessons. The brother already had just a little bit of food. And he gave away the little bit that he had negotiating with these poor white children to give him reading lessons. The brother was more hungry for knowledge than he was for his own food. And we today, we don't have to do that in order to be able to learn how to read, right? You got an internet connection or you got a library in your neighborhood, you can go read for free. How much more free can we be when we have all of these tools at our disposal? And the beautiful thing is, you don't have to start with something like deep and philosophical in order to become a reader. And you don't have to read hours a day. You don't have to read a book a week. Find something that you're interested in. Find something that you already have questions about. And 15 minutes a day of just learning something new every day can radically change your life and begin to help you create psychological freedom, financial freedom, freedom in your relationships and every other area of your life. Yeah, I, th I think this is uh, a really clear testimony to when you know better, you do better. And I think while that is a blanket statement and isn't necessarily 100% true, I think more times than when people know what they didn't know before, that does influence how they make their decision. And I think to live a life in accordance with your values, to to even determine what your values are, to determine what your purpose is, to determine how you fit into this bigger puzzle. So much of that is gained not from just lived experience, but from understanding the landscape, from understanding the game, from understanding the bigger picture. And that's the beauty of you know history. That's the beauty of humanity. That's the beauty of language and communication is being able to share those insights and those stories and I, I think, you know, just kind of taking it on a personal note, for me, when I was in college and I was deciding whether or not that this made sense for me, um, trying to evaluate whether the things that I was learning were actually going to have the impact on my life. Um, I, I came to a point in the road where I decided I was going to take a break because I felt like the knowledge wasn't serving me. But one of the best pieces of advice that my dad gave me um, and, and that is so true today that learning does not stop in the classroom, that it should not just stop when you're being, when you're, when you're, when a teacher is in front of you, that you have to take the onus on you to continue to learn and to be a lifelong student. And again, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that I, I left school to study biology or that I went on to study chemistry. I just started reading the things that I found interesting, things about money, things about success, things about happiness, things about purpose, things about being able uh, to work hard and be more entrepreneurial about my life. And that that year time frame, that six months time frame that I spent really diving into books has just set me on a trajectory that could never have had happen in school, could have never happened um, from being told what to do. It There's so much power 
in, in diving into the things that you're interested in. Um, and it, it, it's really just impossible for me to quantify because for each individual person, I think it's unique. Each individual person has different set of values and things that they want to do. And, and when you feed that, I mean, that knowledge lives forever. You, you talked about uh, Frederick Douglass skipping out on a meal or two. I think, you know, at his young age, he was smart enough. He was insightful enough to know that I'll go hungry for 12 hours or 24 hours, but this knowledge will feed me for a lifetime. And to the extent that you can really step into that, you, you, when you pour into yourself, when you pour into your knowledge and, and the things that you don't know and, and you close the gap, it, it will serve you beyond ways that you can, you can ever imagined. Yeah, 100 percent, man. Amen to that. By the way, I recommend everybody to check out some of uh, Frederick Douglass's speeches. You can you can buy a collection of them online. You can read them for free online. The level of eloquence. <laughs> it's crazy. This wasn't just a brother who could read. He could read and write at a really high level. Let's uh, let's move to the next one, though. This next one up is Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, almost done here. Let's uh, let's take a look at the quote. A little bit of context, Zora Neale Hurston was an American author, anthropologist, and filmmaker. She portrayed racial struggles in the early 1900s American South and published research on hoodoo. The most popular of her four novels is Their Eyes Were Watching God. And here she says, if you are silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say for me, I think this is really about taking your own narrative into your own hands. It's not letting other people write uh, your own history. It's not letting other people write your story. Is having the emotional intelligence to uh, to give yourself that permission to speak out, to, to give yourself um, the ability to allow the truth to come forward. And... I mean, the quote is just so cool because it's it's real slick that um, if you if you're a sil if you're silent, then other people are, are going to write your story and then they're going to tell everybody else that this is how you wanted it to be written. Um, and and a lot of times that isn't the case, but you this is I think a different angle of freedom that we really haven't talked about a lot, but it's that emotional freedom, having the ability to step into what it means to be free, what it means to to feel free and and what those what are those feelings mean and really getting clear and, and vocal in this case about uh, what that experience is like. And, and to the extent, again, coming back to this same lesson, that you're able to, to go towards the truth that you're able to um, and brave enough to move forward, you're going to open and unlock so many doors for other people in the world as a whole. If you if you're not quiet about the pain that you're going through, um, you are in turn serving somebody else who's going through something similar. Yeah, that's right on the money, man. I mean, if you don't take charge of your own narrative, somebody else will. And when they get around to telling your story, it's probably not going to be the story that you want told. And one of the most common ways we victimize ourselves is we expect people to read our minds. We expect people to take care of us. And we're secretly and silently unhappy, secretly and silently frustrated. And it's, it's, it's an unnecessary tragedy. And that tragedy is overcome when we realize that at the end of the day, people are not going to respond to us based on what we want or what we need but they will respond to us based on how we teach them to respond by being the voice for our own concerns. We're gonna close it out with the final one, man. Guy who changed my life, Malcolm X. I read the autobiography of Malcolm X when I was in high school and um, that really changed my life, changed my vision of, 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 of my own sense of possibility in my own world. All right, let's take a look at Malcolm's quote. This is another difficult one, man, because there's so many um, that I could have chose from. But Malcolm X was an African-American Muslim minister and human rights activist who was a popular figure during the civil rights movement. He is best known for his time spent as a vocal spokesman for the Nation of Islam, had much to say about self-determinism, standing up for yourself, fighting for your rights, how to see freedom, and even having a healthy mistrust 
towards politicians. You're not to be so blind with patriotism that you can't face reality. Wrong is wrong, no matter who does it or says it. I'm for truth, no matter who tells it. I'm for justice, no matter who is for or against. I am a human being, first and foremost, and as such, I am for whoever and whatever benefits humanity as a whole. You know, my final thought on this, man, is there is nothing like the freedom you feel when you are able to criticize ideas or celebrate ideas in a way that is uncoupled from any kind of loyalty to a political party. Everything that is good about America, and America is not perfect, but everything that is good about America has been the result of us celebrating the freedom to criticize our government and hold our government accountable to the principles of freedom that this nation is supposed to be founded on. And whenever we find ourselves looking at it as blasphemous or as sacrilegious to question politicians or to criticize someone just because, oh no, uh, that guy's in my political party and I can't do that, we have lost the most important thing, which is the freedom to think critically. It's not about subscribing unwittingly or uncritically to the party line. It's not about signaling to people that are on my team that I'm down for the cause. It's about representing the truth and standing for the truth, no matter who says it, and being willing to call out recklessness and irresponsibility, hypocrisy, anti-freedom, no matter who it comes from. That's really the foundation for freedom. And I think Malcolm X was a true patriot in that regard. He was a true patriot because he wasn't afraid to hold everyone around him accountable to the things that they actually promised. And he challenged black people everywhere he went to not just be loyal to whether it's the Fox that he referred to as the liberals or the wolf that he referred to as the conservatives, be loyal to yourself and be loyal to the people that are building alongside you. Love it. I love it. I, I think that so much of this is true for just the things we talk about at Revolution One, right? Individuality over uh, the group mentality, over the herd mentality, over, over rolling with the masses, really choosing what that inner freedom looks like for you um, and, and really stepping into your individual values, your individual preferences, um, and, and not being afraid to align yourselves with people who are aligned with that. And I, I, I think I, I really liked the last point you made that being able to call out um, and, and hold people accountable from from any and all sides of, of the spectrum. I think one of the healthiest things that I think anybody can do in any community, but especially in the black community, is 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 be honest and call out when you see things that aren't right. Call out um, when you see people that aren't living according to you know their their inner truth. I think that that is how you raise all boats, you know, high tide raises all boats. You you want, um, if you want to like change the world, if you want to impact our community, then then you can't be afraid to to ask people to level up, to ask people to be the next uh, best version of themselves. I think for every generation that has come before us, you know, their hope, their goal, the things that they work toward is for the next generation to be better. And that can't happen unless there are those of us who are willing to push this thing forward, to push the status quo, to break the limitations, and then to call out the people who, you know, may be supporting those limitations, who may be, um, you know, living in complacency, who, who, who may, who may be trying to fight against progress. And I think that's such an important piece, you know, whether um, they're black, they're white, they're Spanish, it doesn't matter. I think if, if they're within a group that you associate with, you have to be, um, you have to have enough conviction to call out and, and to say, no, we, we got to rise up. We have to uh, be the next best version of what we came and do what we came here to do. You, you cut out, man. I think you might be on mute. Oh, man, I was just saying word up, brother. I love it. I don't care about your label. I care about your logic. I care about the way you live. 
And I care about the way you compel and challenge me to live. All right, y'all. That's a wrap. The revolution will be live streamed. I'll be popping on tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern time going live for TK's Two Cents. Be sure to tune in. Otherwise, we'll see you all next week for the revolution will live. It will be live streamed. Peace out.